Wake Forest slow mesh is one of the most unique plays in all of football. But how does it work? Wake Forest isn't having their best season this year. Their offense is currently ranked as the 77th best in the country by F+, an opponent-adjusted metric, which is their lowest mark since 2016, only Dave Clawson's third year as head coach. It's also a far cry from Wake offenses of the recent past. Their 2021 team had the fifth best offense in the country according to the same metric. Instead of dwelling too much on what's going on in what seems to be a rebuilding year for the Deeks, I wanted to dive into and ultimately teach you how to read the concept that has helped make Wake one of the best places to watch offensive innovation in action. That concept is their slow mesh RPO. And while I don't have access to their playbook, I've broken down an entire year's worth of these plays, and I think I found what makes this concept click. Let's start by defining a standard RPO, or run pass option. Essentially, these are plays that isolate a defender who has both run and pass responsibility. Often, this is a linebacker or safety. You then make him choose one. If he collapses towards his run gap, it opens up the pass. And if he stays back, it gives an open gap for the running back to run through. On the surface, this seems like a pretty bulletproof offensive strategy, but there are ways defenses can defend it. Firstly, you can eliminate this conflict by playing straight man coverage, but only a select few teams have the cats that can pull this off throughout a full game. The other options are a bit more nuanced. One thing teams can do is slow play the RPO. Basically, this has the conflict player patiently sit in the passing window and then collapse hard after the ball is given. This often works to limit the play, but still gives up some yardage. The final things can do, especially if they know an RPO is coming, is have the conflict player hang in the passing lane and replace him with a backside defender. That still gets numbers in the box. I can best illustrate this using the base formation Wake uses to run these slow mesh RPOs. They almost always are in 11 personnel, with one running back and one tight end, and for our purposes, it doesn't really matter which side the tight end is on since he only ever blocks. This gives six blockers for the run, and let's say the defense matches that number with six box defenders, which is really the minimum you ever see teams have on standard downs. This offensive formation means there's three receivers to spread out. Wake always puts two on one side and one on the other. So I'll refer to this as the two receiver side and one receiver side from here on out. Again, if the defense allocates the bare minimum to cover these guys, which would be one defender per receiver, you would get this setup with two players left. Let's call these the plus one players. If you only have six box defenders against this look, then there's no one to account for the running back. But on the other hand, if you use those plus ones to stop the run, then your corners will live on islands all game, which is also less than ideal. But if the offense runs an RPO and you could keep one of those plus ones back to force the run while bringing the other down to get seven in the box, then you effectively stop the play in its tracks. Wake's figured out a clever way around this, but before we get there, let's talk about each component individually, with the assumption that they'll have advantageous numbers. The run part comes first in the name, so let's start there. I believe they run a kind of man blocking scheme, more specifically a variation called duo. Since they always have six blockers and this is a man scheme, it follows that they each have one of six guys. Typically in duo, the tight end has the end man on the line of scrimmage and everyone else has whoever is lined up, head up, or to their backside. But here's the deal. These uncovered linemen can't release downfield to block the linebackers, since there's a chance the quarterback pulls to throw the ball downfield. That's where the name duo comes from. Duo implies that if they don't have a man on the line of scrimmage, they turn and help double the man to their front side. This leaves the backers unblocked. And while that sounds like an issue, it's really not since there are now more running lanes than there are people to fill them. It's the running back's job then to find the empty gap. This style of blocking also means they don't have to get vertical push by the offensive line. They just have to use double teams to open up gaps and let the running back do the rest. Okay, if I lost you at any point in the blocking rules, the important thing is this. If you don't give a plus one to the box, you won't have enough guys to stop the run. And Wake doesn't even need to make tough blocks in order to win that matchup. They just need to stalemate your defensive tackle with two of their linemen. So that's the run part of it. It never really changes for these slow mesh RPOs. On to the passing game. Again, let's assume they have ideal numbers, which would basically be one-on-ones across the board. Let's start with a one receiver side. Their go-to here is just a deep in route, what I'll call a dig. This is a great man beater for outside receivers. 
Since these outside cornerbacks typically have their help inside, they tend to play outside leverage to funnel the receivers back into that help. But since we've taken the plus one away, they now no longer have help there. They'll also occasionally take shots. Usually this is a post instead of a go for the same reasons I just listed. I'm still undecided whether this is a natural route conversion from the dig, but because Hartman tends to start his windup before the break, I'm going to assume that these are pre-called routes. And then you'll also see them run these hitches, but that almost always happens when you're getting some kind of really soft coverage, or you also see it when teams bring a corner blitz. The two receiver side doesn't play much differently. Again, we're assuming man for a man, so two defenders for two receivers, and just like the other side, they love digs against the outside corner to take advantage of his outside leverage. The inside receiver typically runs what's called a pivot route. If this defender is playing off, the quarterback will hit that route quickly. But if they run into a situation where that inside defender is tied on the pivot route, then the receiver will carry him further outside to make space for the dig coming back inside. But that's just in theory. They actually didn't throw the dig route at all in 2021 on this two receiver side. Again, you'll see them tag a post instead of a dig to take shots if they see a look that they like. You'll also occasionally see this levels concept, which is the same concept as the dig pivot, but just with the roles reversed between the inside and outside receivers. The other thing they do from this two receiver side is to take shots from the inside receiver. Typically this comes in the form of a slot fade, but once in a while they'll run essentially a flip slot fade where the outside receiver runs the fade and the inside receiver runs an out, but here they typically throw the out instead of the fade. Okay, that's a lot of information in a short segment. But really the takeaway here is if you give Wake numbers to the passing game, they have good ways to take advantage of typical defensive leverage to reliably move the ball through the air. But their ability to scheme up wins against light boxes or against advantageous passing numbers isn't really unique to Wake. I mean, it was the foundation of the run pass option movement to begin with. What really makes this play so dangerous is their ability to never be wrong. This is where I first noticed it. Look here at the quarterback's eyes before he hands this ball off. He checks one way, then the other. You can see it every time they give the ball on one of these plays. One side, then the other. That's when I realize he's not just reading one plus one player. He's reading both plus ones. This isn't a run pass option. This is a run pass pass option. The slow mesh is slow because it allows him to run two RPOs in one play. So from that, I created some rules. Again, I don't have access to their playbook or anything, but if you follow these rules, you can predict where the ball goes post-snap 99% of the time. Step one, since this is a man blocking play with six blockers, find the first six defenders in the box. Step two, identify the plus one on each side of the ball. These are the most likely defenders to enter the box outside of those six. Sometimes it's a corner or linebacker, but often it's the safety. You can usually tell because they're the ones either closest to the box to begin with or the one who's eyeing the box early. Step three, watch the two plus ones post snap. If either comes, replace them with the ball. If neither comes, hand it off. It's that simple. So let's have some practice. Step one, identify six box defenders. Step two, identify two plus ones. Step three, read it post snap. Where should the ball go? All right, let's try that again. Step one, identify six box defenders. Step two, identify two plus ones. Step three, read it post snap. Where should the ball go? All right, one last time, but this time without the cues. So now you're an expert. Actually, to be fair, I'm not even an expert, but what I do know is this play is really cool when you dive into it. And it helps explain how Dave Clawson has that group consistently overachieving their recruiting rankings. This may be a down season for Wake, but as long as they're on the cutting edge of offensive innovation, I think they'll quickly find their way back. Thanks for watching. 
I was told last season that Clawson said that no media member has ever correctly predicted how they read this play. I still may not be right, but I gave it the old college try. Wake fans, if I missed something or you know more about this play that I didn't mention or flat out got wrong, please let me know in the comments below. FSU fans, if you happen to stick through, I hope that I gave you a better appreciation for this beautiful game. Like always, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you over on Knowles247 to continue the conversation. Thanks.